If you were one of the 25 million Americans that took up running during the boom of the 1970s, when you stepped up to the start line of your first marathon, you wouldn't have had cushioned shoes to support your feet. There would have been no carbohydrate gels in your pockets to refuel during the race. Nor would you have had an MP3 player playing your favorite songs. No heart rate monitor, no GPS, no stopwatch. This is in stark contrast to the marathon running today. When our research group surveyed runners in the 2018 Dublin Marathon, 99.5%, all but one, said they would be using some kind of wearable device like a smartwatch or a fitness band to track their race. And today's runners are spoiled for choice when it comes to wearable technologies. Watches, wristbands, rings, socks, foot soles and earbuds can gather data about pace, heart rate, energy expenditure, blood oxygenation, respiratory rate, cadence and body temperature. The first commercially available wearable biosensor that achieved widespread adoption was the Fitbit Classic in 2009. This was the first wireless activity tracker that could synchronize data with the internet and have the same data available on a mobile phone. By 2014, there had been a proliferation in the number of wearable activity trackers available to consumers. A key innovator was Basis, whose wristband differed from the state of the art at the time by collecting heart rate data, as well as activity levels, sleep, sweat, and skin temperature. 2014 was also the year that big tech joined the fray. Google introduced Wear OS, the first operating system specifically designed for wearable devices, and soon after, Apple released its first wearable, the Apple Watch, in 2015. The opportunity most of these big companies were and are pursuing to this day is primarily in healthcare. But the earliest adopters of these technologies have been fitness enthusiasts, and as a result, they've become their biggest market. These people use wearables to biohack their bodies, to increase sleep quality, manage stress or improve performance. But before we can evaluate the veracity of the biohacking concept, first we need to discuss how wearable sensors actually work. Well, all body signals begin with the interaction between a biological receptor and an analyte. A biological receptor or bioreceptor can either be an enzyme, a cell, a tissue, a nucleic acid, an antibody, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that the interaction between the bioreceptor and an analyte creates a signal. This signal may take the form of a change in light, charge, mass, heat, or some other entity. Whatever that basic signal may be, keep in mind that it is represented in higher level functions at the system level, like the beating of your heart, the activity in your brain, the contraction of a muscle, or the movement of your limbs. In any case, the interaction between the bioreceptor and its analyte is called biorecognition. Biorecognition usually results in the emission of a signal and the recognition region and transducer of the wearable device together play the key role in converting that basic physical, chemical or electrical signal into another kind of measurable signal. This conversion of one form of energy signal to another by the biotransducer is termed signalization. Generally, biotransducers generate either optical or electrical signals, and these are somewhat proportional to the concentration of the analyte bioreceptor interaction that kicks the whole process off. Now, it's important to highlight that the signal that is generated by the biotransducer often contains incomplete information about the underlying signal. There are often errors, inconsistencies, and noise. It's rare that signalization produces a perfect representation of the underlying biological signal. To accommodate this, once the data is gathered, it generally needs to be processed. It needs to be filtered, structured, cleaned, and validated to improve its actionability, to actually make it meaningful and a valid representation of the underlying biological signal. The processing stage can be extremely complex. Entire strands of research exist investigating the best way to process a biological signal to ensure that they are valid and reliable and that they represent the underlying signal. But I'm not going to delve into that research here. There's a lot of ongoing research in this field, not least in the area of running. And it tends to go out of date quickly because companies regularly release new hardware and push software updates or patches to their devices several times in a single year. 
The challenge is that, as technology advances, determining whether a wearable is either valid or reliable needs constant re-evaluation. With that in mind, the research into the use of wearables for running can be divided into seven main buckets related to the measurement of distance or speed, heart rate, energy expenditure, aerobic capacity, lactate threshold, running biomechanics, and running power. You might assume that measuring distance would be simple because it relies on GPS, but even this is prone to error. A study published in 2020 comparing a range of smartwatches, other activity trackers and smartphones showed that the median error rates were between 0.6 and 1.5%, with turns and hilly segments being linked with greater error. This may seem to be not too bad, but over the course of a 26 mile race, that equates to about 500 meters. And considering so many other features and recommendations around pacing strategies and predicted finish times are based on GPS, this can have a profound knock-on effect. But now, in 2023, companies like Garmin have started to use multiple satellite or multiband frequencies in their newest smartwatches. With multiple satellite frequencies, the receiver can use more advanced methods to determine which signals have less error, thus improving position accuracy. The net result for tracking your running is better accuracy in more challenging environments, like when the signals are being reflected off buildings or in cases where the signal is blocked under trees, for example. The measurement of heart rate involves the use of photoplethysmography or optical blood flow sensing. Photoplethysmography sensors use an optical probe, usually LEDs, to shine light directly into the skin and the underlying blood vessels. Blood flow through a vessel is inversely related to the amount of the LED's light that is being refracted, so as the blood pulses through the vessels, this is recorded and signalization of heart rate is achieved. Like the measurement of distance, the accuracy of heart rate measurement is improving with the development of better optical sensors and as algorithms become more refined. For heart rate sensors like those typically found in wrist-worn wearables, studies evaluating accuracy compared with the gold standard of a chest-worn heart rate monitor have found errors of between 1.4 and 13%. Errors are worse for certain times of exercises, for instance, calisthenic or bodyweight exercises, and in certain conditions, like when it's cold. Energy expenditure is particularly tricky to measure using wearables. The gold standard here is the doubly labelled water method, which involves administering a dose of water in which both the hydrogen and oxygen atoms have been partly or completely replaced or labelled with an uncommon isotope of these elements, like deuterium and oxygen-18, to a research participant, and then measuring the rate at which their body eliminates these isotopes over time through regular sampling of heavy isotope concentrations in their saliva, urine or blood. By measuring the changing levels of these isotopes, it's possible to determine how much oxygen left their body as carbon dioxide. Since the body only produces carbon dioxide through metabolism, the amount of carbon dioxide lost is a proxy for the amount of energy that has been produced. The doubly labelled water method isn't exactly feasible for day-to-day -day use, so manufacturers of wearable devices have sought to integrate multi-dimensional constructs like triaxial accelerometry, heat sensors and photoplethysmography heart rate sensors to estimate energy expenditure. A systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2020 found error rates to be high. For instance, depending on the device, energy expenditure was underestimated by over 20% and overestimated by nearly 15%. The authors did however find that accuracy improved for devices that combined more inputs. Devices that relied on accelerometry alone were prone to higher error compared with those that also used heart rate, for example. One of the most interesting variables to runners, and probably the next most commonly measured variable by the latest crop of running watches, aside from distance, heart rate and energy expenditure, is aerobic capacity, or VO2 max. We've talked previously about the gold standard VO2 max measurement in the lab, but as a brief recap, VO2 max, maximal oxygen uptake, is the greatest amount of oxygen that can be used by the entire body and is related to the ability of the heart and lungs 
to transport oxygen and the ability of body tissues to use it. VO2 max is normally measured in a laboratory setting through a maximal running test. A person's VO2 max can be determined directly as they breathe through a mask while completing an incremental test to voluntary failure. Obviously, wearables don't have the capacity to replicate this test, so they use algorithms to predict what a person's VO2 max is. The inputs in these algorithms is usually some combination of heart rate and running speed. As we've already seen, both of these inputs are prone to error themselves, so it's no surprise that so too are the VO2 max predictions. It depends on what algorithm is being used, but errors can be up to 5%. For someone with a predicted VO2 max of 50 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of mass per minute, their true value could be anywhere between 47.5 and 52.5. Lactate threshold, like VO2 max, can be estimated using a combination of heart rate and pace data. Recall that your lactate threshold is the intensity of exercise that causes lactate to accumulate in the blood at a faster rate than it can be removed. When lactate production exceeds its clearance rate, it quickly accumulates, causing increased acidity in tissues, and this contributes to feelings of fatigue. Put simply, runners that are above their lactate threshold will eventually start to slow down, and those that have higher lactate thresholds can go faster for longer. In the lab, lactate threshold is measured by drawing blood at intervals during an incremental test to directly measure the buildup of lactate. No commercially available wearables can directly measure lactate threshold yet, but estimates can be made using heart rate, pace and VO2 max data. By measuring heart rate, heart rate variability and pace stability during an incremental exercise test, several currently available running watches can estimate lactate threshold. Data evaluating the accuracy of these estimates is hard to come by, but one conference paper published in 2021, which used the Garmin Phoenix 6, significantly underestimated the speed at which lactate accumulation occurred by 10.4%. As with VO2 max and lactate thresholds, the gold standard approach to evaluating biomechanics of running necessitates a visit to the research lab. Participants will generally be instrumented with a set of reflective markers and asked to run either on a treadmill or over a surface incorporating a stationary force plate. But unlike VO2 max and lactate threshold, the gold standard here is not exactly flawless. The trouble is that the data lab protocols produce tends to lack generalizability because they do not exactly replicate running in the real world. The results, and therefore the conclusions that can be made based on those results, have limited practical meaning or external validity. In contrast, wearable sensors that contain accelerometers and gyroscopes have the potential to collect biomechanical data from runners in their natural environment. Wrist-worn wearables and those placed on the foot have been used to estimate spatiotemporal variables like the number of steps you take per minute, otherwise known as your cadence, your step and stride lengths, and your vertical oscillation albeit with variable accuracy. One study found error rates between 0 and 27% for these variables, for example. Foot soles that contain pressure sensors can be used to evaluate your foot strike patterns. For more nuanced variables related to symmetry or technique, though, it's unclear whether biomechanical analysis, whether conducted in the lab or in the real world using wearable sensors, can actually tell the runner something meaningful that they can train or target. For instance, while there are generic kinematic characteristics of faster runners, like having a higher cadence, less forward lean at the trunk, and landing with a near horizontal foot, there is so much kinematic individuality that when we try to pool together the data for lots of different runners, each with different running styles and body shapes, this individuality tends to get averaged out. It then becomes really hard to make links between nuanced biomechanical variables and performance. Similarly, running economy is linked with the biomechanics of running, but no current commercially available wearable biosensors can accurately measure running economy. Recall that running economy is the volume of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per kilometer. Because no wearable can measure oxygen uptake, none can determine your running economy, yet at least. 
Some prediction algorithms may yet be developed, but none are available right now. A new metric that has been marketed to runners over the last five years is running power, which is measured in watts. We produce power as we run. Most of this power is supplied by muscles and is converted to heat, and the small fraction that doesn't propels us forward. Running power, then, is a way to measure the output of the work you're doing when you run. The higher the watts, the more power you're generating with every step. The more power you can generate at a lower heart rate or faster pace, the more efficient you are. Cyclists have been using power for many years as a way to produce consistent performance in both training and racing. But power has taken a while to make its way to running because, unlike cycling where power can be measured directly, during running there are far more biomechanical and situational variables that make it much harder to generate accurate and useful data. In short, there is no gold standard for the measurement of running power. In the context of running, it is a variable that has been adapted from cycling and marketed to runners before it has been validated. That said, it may be a useful adjunct to more traditional measures like pace and heart rate. Theoretically, power tracks the actual work output of every step rather than your heart's response or the pace that results from that work. For example, if you decided to base your training on your speed or heart rate, aiming for specific heart rate zones or lap times, factors like heat or altitude can increase your heart rate relative to your pace. In contrast, power is a great equalizer as it reflects the output of your muscles rather than the environment they and the rest of your body is working in. Similarly, let's say you complete a particularly hilly race, which is more demanding. Looking at your heart rate and pace alone would make it seem as if your performance was worse when compared with a race on a flatter course. However, your power, the force generated by your muscles to climb those hills, will better reflect your performance and would allow you to compare, in theory at least, the two races. But the trouble is that power is measured and estimated differently depending on the device you use. Some devices, like Stride, measure the motion pattern of your body's centre of mass and the incline you're running on using a foot sensor. Based on your body mass, the device estimates how much power your muscles are producing to move your centre of mass. In contrast, the RPM2 device calculates power directly from a foot sole, and the first running watch to track running power from the wrist was the Polar Vantage 5, which estimates power using GPS-based speed and data on elevation captured by its built-in barometric sensors. The issue is that all of these methods produce slightly different power readings, and because there is no gold standard, it's not possible to determine which is the most accurate or reliable. Stride have released their own evaluation, which showed that their system is 96% correlated with metabolic energy expenditure. But the study was not published in a peer-reviewed academic journal, the data were not made available for evaluation, and the study was only conducted on a small sample, 13 runners, with the correlation determined based on a subset of 9. These findings should be considered preliminary and need to be independently replicated in larger cohorts of runners by researchers without a conflict of interest in trying to sell a product. I'll finish by highlighting that important point. The primary issue with wearables in running contexts today is that very few of the metrics they tout will actually improve your performance or make you run a better race. None have been validated independently. The companies selling these products tend to deliver well-crafted pitches about their product, about how it can make you a better or a faster runner. But generally, they fail to back up their claims with large longitudinal, independently gathered data sets. This is true of wearables for monitoring hydration status, running power, training loads, movement patterns, injury risk, aerobic and anaerobic capacity, and psychological stress or that claim to be able to measure your body battery or your real-time stamina in a race. Just because your smartwatch can measure your GPS and heart rate doesn't mean it can tell you how far you can run at a given pace before exhaustion. It can't replace the central governor. <laughs>